Okay, so welcome everybody for today's talk. And today we have the pleasure to, to listen to Denis Ricardo Cândido. Uh, Denis is a professor at the Iowa University since 2019. He did his uh, uh, graduation, his master in PhD physics in São Carlos, at USP São Carlos, with Professor Carlos Eggs. And then he went away for a postdoc in Iowa, in Chicago. He spent some uh, time in many universities, in Cornell, Colorado State University, Basel University in Switzerland, the Würzburg University in Germany, the International Institute of Physics in Natal, uh, uh, and many other visiting uh, positions uh, around these universities. And then it works with uh, a series of topics in condensed matter physics. I would like to emphasize a couple of them here. So topological insulators in 2D, uh, bio and DDC metals, spin relaxation, uh, effective Hamiltonians, group theory, K.P methods, uh, um, quantum open systems, quantum magnetics, and so on. It's a very large uh, set of topics, most of them centered uh, on, on the talk he's going to talk about uh, today. So I would like to, to thank Dennis for accepting the, the, the invitation to, to give us a talk. And the mic is yours, feel free. And just to give you a warning, if there's any, any question from the audience, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you uh, whenever I can, okay? Sounds great. Uh, thank you, Gerson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be presenting um, remotely at your um, seminar series. Uh, I was planning to be in person last year and this year, but things did not work out. But hopefully in the near future, I'm going to be stopping by and giving a talk in person and also catching up with uh, many of the people that I know from from Uberlandia. So, um, so as Jerson said, my name is Dennis, and uh, so today I'm going to be essentially describing uh, some of the works that I developed as a postdoc, uh, um, working with uh, Michael Fate, uh, but also I'm also going to be mentioning and covering some uh, extensions and like some works that I have been developing in my own group. So, uh, of course, this. Uh, this work would not be possible without collaborators. And here I'm just like outlining uh, the most important of them. So we have Flate from University of Iowa. We also have um, Greg Fuchs from Cornell University. And uh, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> and um, David Oshalom and Masaya Fukami from the University of Chicago. And last but not least, uh, Zeke Halperin from Ohio State University. So. So the topic of this uh, talk, it's going to be uh, essentially the use of uh, magnetic uh, hybrid quantum systems to, sorry, to uh, entangle and, um, and couple spin centers in solid state qubits. And uh, so, and the, the outline that I that I created to to be able to accomplish that, it's essentially. Uh, and I, I, by the way, I must say that uh, George asked me to give a very like pedagogical uh, talk, more or, less, more or less like a colloquium. So I try to avoid like equations and all that kind of stuff uh, and try to like focus more on the, the fundamental physics of uh, what we're going to be describing here. So and um, I don't need to say that if you guys have any questions at any moment, just feel free to stop me, but I'm going to be making like some pauses between these four topics of my outline to, to address questions. So the first thing you, I'm going to be like introducing what we call a spin defect defects or spin centers in solids. And I'm going to be describing why they're like good and long lived uh, uh, qubits. Uh, then we're going to like switch gears and we're going to be like describing about all the problems that they face for quantum technology implementations. Uh, and then I'm going to be providing one one possible solution for this problem, which is going to be the main focus of this talk. And uh, I'm in the final part of my talk, if I have time, I'm going to be talking about like some some further directions that we are pursuing here in my group. So so uh, so starting from the beginning, uh, let me just move my mouse here. Uh, before like talking about qubits, I, I just would like to revisit 
kind of very quickly the concept behind a classical and quantum bits. Probably most of you already know that, but it's it's worth just going quickly through this. So if we start with classical bits, uh, we know uh, that the bits are essentially the fundamental concept, if you will, of uh, classical computation and classical information. So they're kind of like the basic uh, unit of uh, of information used in the most uh, most of the computing and digital communications, uh, if not in, in all of them. And uh, and as we know, this bit is a logical state, so it can assume two possible values, which is being represented here by zero uh, and one, or, or blue uh, or green and red. And uh, and in classical in classical computing, uh, this these bits are taken by the computer. They are processed by the classical components of of this uh, of this computer uh, using uh, arithmetics and logic, logical operations, and then they, these are returned to the computer as kind of like an answer, and uh, also written in bits. Uh, so 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 what I want to say here is everything it's done in terms of like these bits, but like for for quantum computing, sorry, there's some, yeah okay. But in what regards this uh, quantum computing, everything now it's done, it's done in terms of quantum bits or qubits, okay? And, and for this object, the story, it's a little bit different. And the definition now it's given by the superposition of two different states uh, named cat zero and cat one here with coefficients uh, alpha uh, and beta. And uh, having a lag here between slides. Okay, and, and by recalling that the states in quantum mechanics, they must be like normalized to one, we can interpret this alpha and beta as being represented by uh, the length of the sides of this regular triangular, uh, if we assume alpha and beta real. So, uh, so this is just like a basic 2D visualization of a qubit, and it demonstrates like this infinite possibilities of, of this uh, finite size state. And, uh, and so, and of course, if we are at the North Pole, we have the pure state one. If we are at the South Pole, we have the pure state zero. So, uh, another interesting property of the qubits uh, it's that it's that um, is the entanglement essentially. An entanglement it's essentially uh, it's present in a, in a general state if we're not able to decompose. The, the total wave function of this two qubit state as a product of the wave function of one state times the wave function of the other qubit. Okay, so namely here, so psi of a and psi of b, and, uh, and 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 due and due to this like this entang this uh, superposition and the entanglement, we actually actually can this give rise to two interesting super famous uh, kind of like facts or statements. Uh, which the first one is the quantum cryptography, which just like you can prove that it's impossible to copy a general and unknown quantum state. And the other one is this, this type of like quantum parallelism, as people call, which uh, it's kind of like it's faster for some, uh, some like tasks, as for instance, uh, number factorization, which is the idea behind Shor's algorithm. And actually, this like these two reasons are actually these two facts are actually the main reason for for having a lot of people uh, and companies investing uh, a lot of money uh, on, on this technology. So there's a lot of companies investing on fabricating their own, their own com quantum computer, and we have been hearing about this uh, during the last decade. And uh, and that's all, all of those things is great, but as a theorist, uh, uh, why we should care about this uh, quantum quantum technologies and uh, and well we do care about it because uh, this this type of uh, this type of technologies are super uh, important to address and investigate fundamental questions of nature okay like for instance entanglement measurement of Bell's inequality that just uh, received the Nobel Prize in the last year uh, super dense coding and etc cetera, etc cetera. so so having this realistic co realistic and practical system to realize that quantum technologies is also super important from the point of view of a fundamental study of quantum mechanical properties. And uh, so, 
So uh, back to qubits, the first qubits in condensed matter, they were obtained by using Gallimard and I quantum dots, where those essential qubits are given by uh, states of individual electrons. And here, these electrons, they are uh, created or obtained by uh, having like gates, creating an electrostatic potential, thus confining and also controlling uh, individual electrons and uh, within quantum dots, and also uh, uh, coupling between different quantum dots. And uh, the first, uh, the first two papers uh, are are like shown here: this PRA and and this PRB uh, by Daniel Laws and David Chenzo, and also by Guido. And it's kind of interesting to note that neither of them are a pure RL, but uh, so which is kind of uh, amusing to say the least. But, uh, but th this is like the two first uh, papers that introduced quantum dots as a way to implement com quantum computation, solid state physics. And, sorry, yeah. Okay, and, uh, and so, so here in the left, we have this, one of the two first implementations of this quantum dot. So uh, here we, we can see by this like more light gray lines, the, the electrostatic gates uh, confining the electrons within this kind of double circles. And here we have like a two qubit and two qubit. And uh, here we have also another gate, which essentially kind of controls this interaction between uh, these two different qubits. So that's essentially how things work. And, uh, and this, is, this is like for electron, but you can also extend the same concept for, uh, for a quantum dot made of holes. And, uh, and this was like first achieved by the Coven-Hoven groups in, in this nature and technology paper here. And uh, so, so now I would like to spend more time uh, talking about how, uh, how this works, how this quantum dot works with a little bit more of detail. So, so uh, and for the students, I think this is just gonna be, this just requires like basic concept of quantum mechanics or the modern physics. So you're essentially gonna be like solving an electron in an infinite well. Okay, so you guys already uh, know what's gonna be the answer for. We're gonna be having like this wave functions that oscillate and the energy it's gonna be quantized uh, and uh, the energy spacing is gonna be proportional to, to the numbers of the, the number of the level squared. And, uh, and what is important here, it's actually this dependence with the, the length of the well squared, okay? So which means that the frequency, the energy separation between consecutive energy levels, they're proportional to one over the length is squared here. And uh, so in, in, this, in those experiments, so they first create this uh, infinite well by those electrostatic potential gates and then they focus, uh, or they, yeah, they kind of like focus in the lowest two energy levels. Uh, then they apply Z Zeeman, um, they apply a magnetic field, which just lifts the degeneracy of these uh, levels. And then finally, they choose, uh, this, let's say two frequency, uh, two energy levels. And this is what essentially like defines this qubits in, in uh, the sort of qubit in, in solid state platform, okay? And here it's just, it's just like one representation, but you could choose really uh, any two of those. And uh, and due to the uh, qubit radius of these quantum dots being around 50 nanometers and the magnetic field being able to vary from 0.1 to, to one Tesla in those setups, uh, this actually imposes a, a limit for the operating temperature of those qubits of around like 100 of millikelvin. And, uh, and of course, like 100 of millikelvin, that's like not very practical. That's not super easy to implement. So like the natural question, it's actually how do we improve this scenario, right? So, um, so how do we essentially improve the temp operating temperature of, of the qubits in solid state physics? So, and actually the, the whole answer for that, it's really like decreasing the size of your, uh, of your quantum dot, okay, of your system. So if you decrease the, si the, the size of the quantum dot, you're gonna essentially increase the splitting between the energy levels. And uh, so how did people improve this? Well, they actually, the, the, they moved like away from quantum dots and then they started to uh, defining qubits uh, by, by this uh, donor energy levels, uh, phosphor and, and, and kind of like silicon. 
So now instead of having, let's say, a quantum dot with, with a qubit radii of around like 50, now you have like this qubit radii, effectively qubit radii of like five nanometers essentially. So like one order of magnitude smaller. So which essentially brings the, the operating temperature to like five Kelvin or so. So, uh, so this is already like better because now you can have those uh, spins, those qubits in, in, in more ordinary refrigerators. And, uh, but people like went way further. So, and start asking how we can decrease even more the effective size of the, of this, of the qubits. And that's essentially going to be the main focus of my talk today. So, uh, they actually recently have seen that, um, this defect the spin centers, uh, as for example, the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond and silicon and the vacancies in silicon carbides, those, uh, uh, the electrons in, in those defects, they're actually uh, centered and confined within a 0.5 nanometers of uh, length, which brings the operating temperature of those uh, qubits for, from 300 Kelvin to 450 Kelvin. So, so essentially like room temperature. So, uh, and this is the system we're going to be exploring here. here. So essentially uh, this is like the two most like famous examples. So in the left we have uh, a silicon carbide lattice and here you can see like there's like some vacancy so there's like missing atoms and uh, so essentially the dangling bones from these atoms the, for the from for that from the adjacent atoms they're going to be localized around these vacancies and this is going to create effectively uh, discrete energy levels okay and uh, and this is actually what they use for 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 the qubits and the thing the same thing also happens for for this diamond lattice so you have essentially a diamond and then you go there and you remove, like uh, you substitute the carbon atom by a nitrogen atom, and you also remove a adjacent carbon atom nearby. So you have this what they call like nitrogen vacancy center effect, and uh, and this the systems they present like very interesting properties, as I'm gonna say uh, later on and describe more deeply. So that's essentially how the field, the solid state field, evolved in regards of like quantum bits, so really decreasing the size so you can enhance uh, the splitting and therefore increase the operating temperatures. And it's kind of like, a, it, I always like to comment that as, as, a, as, a, as physicists, we're usually, uh, we, we also, we usually like tend to think that um, perfect crystals are actually the better. Uh, so we always like have this kind of perfectionist idea about uh, about systems in general but what is super intriguing is that it's really defects in crystal lattice that makes uh one of the best qubits ever seen in nature so uh so yeah so that's essentially this and so this is like a tree of like probably the most important papers in the area showing that uh the coherence of those qubits rich uh second uh seconds so like very, uh, very robust, even at room temperature. So which means that they can be uh, very good uh, uh, candidates for, for solid state quantum bits. But they also, as we're gonna see, they're also like good for quantum sensing, quantum memory, and also quantum information processing. I'm gonna be commenting more about that. Um, so the, so if we focus on, the, the focus of this talk is gonna be on the nitrogen vacancy center in diamonds. And, uh, and if you think about this structure here, we have this nitrogen, one dangling bone, we have three carbons and three corresponding dangling bones, and then we have the vacancy. So essentially the whole, the energy levels of this qubit, it's gonna be essentially given by uh, this uh, hybridization of these like four orbitals. And, uh, and of course you can use like group theory and you can describe this uh, linear, you can ask what are the possible linear combinations that transform as the basis functions of the of the C3V EREP, which is the, 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 the group, the point group symmetry of this, uh, this kind of compound here. And that, so this is what essentially what you're going to have. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you've got, you just like the takeaway message here is that this, uh, the single energy state is just like, uh, it's formed by the hybridization of these four orbitals here. And of course you can then populate this energy state and create your many body energy diagram, which is represented here. So we have a, a effective 
uh, a spin triplet ground state, a spin triplet excited state, and also some intermediate singlet state that we're going to be uh, commenting uh, about their importance soon. So, so if we like focus now on the ground state, that's how this uh, this Hamiltonian looks like. So uh, it's like a spin one Hamiltonian, which of, with a very like interesting uh, lift of the degeneracy uh, between all of these straights of with a frequency around 2.8 gigahertz. And uh, this is like super convenient for the experimentalists because as I mentioned before, to define a qubit uh, using quantum dots, you need to apply some magnetic field to break the degeneracy of the spin up and spin down. But here what's interesting is that the crystal field uh, of diamond already does that job for us. So you don't need to apply any magnetic field to be able to define uh, your qubit. So this is like very practical from, from experimental point of view. But if you want to apply some magnetic field, the system also responds. So there is also Zeeman associated to the triplet plus one and triplet minus one. Um, and the Zeeman splitting is kind of like, it's quite sensitive. So we have around 2.8 megahertz per Gauss of shift. So, uh, and this is going to be used to also sense magnetic field as we're going to see later. And uh, so this is essentially like the properties, the ground state properties. So this is like more precisely speaking, this is actually a Q-treat instead of a, a qubit, simply because you have actually three energy levels uh, instead of two. But are you always going to be focusing on like uh, effective, this, the lowest two energy levels over here? And uh, so, um, so, so if we take a look at this, uh, the complete energy level now, uh, this is essentially what we're going to find. So at room temperature, we have this uh, ground state kind of equally populated. And, uh, and uh, now we're going to see like how we initialize and how we read those qubits, because this is like super important for quantum computations in general. And the way we initialize is actually using like green laser. Uh, uh, we're just like shine green laser. So by shining green laser in the material, you're going to be exciting some of the electrons to the, the excited manifold. Uh, some of the electrons are going to decay, producing like some photoluminescence. But what is interesting here is that there is going to be like some non-radiative decay from the plus or minus one to this intermediate state and back to the plus to the MS equals to plus. So after, which means that after shining this green laser for a long time, your system, uh, it's gonna be populated uh, with MS equals to zero, okay? So that's like how this in optical initialization of these qubits work. So you really just like shine laser and you have after microseconds, your state initialized into the, the MS equals to zero. Uh, and then you can just like apply quantum gate operations and etc. But um, okay, so now how do you read? So you're already seeing how we initialize, how do you read? So now suppose that you have your, your qubit initialized in the ground state and that's equals to zero, and then you shine laser again. So this is gonna excite the spin to uh, MS equals to zero, so a spin conserving transition. And later this is gonna decay and it's gonna produce a, like a photoluminescence. And, uh, and for this reason, this is what people call like the bright state. Okay, so we're gonna see some photoluminescence coming out of that. But uh, conversely, uh, if you have your system initialized, your qubit initialized into the plus or minus one, and you shine green laser, most likely this spin is gonna take this non-radiative, the electron's gonna take this non-radiative detour, uh, which is non-radiative, and therefore it's not gonna emit any light. So uh, this is what people call like the dark state, okay? So really, so the, so it's interesting that like this system, both the initialization and the reads, it's done optically. And you might not like realize the importance of this, but uh, well, from the experimental point of view, this is like super important because like green laser, I mean, everyone uh, have, have a green laser at home. So and it's essentially like the same green laser that they use to initialize this. And, uh, and, and you can even like buy kits, like quantum bit kits, made of like nitrogen vacancy center in diamond and you just can like see the initialization of this qubit, uh, the read and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like super convenient. And it also means that you don't need to do that locally, right? Since you can shine a laser from long distance. So it's, this is like super, uh, super convenient from the experimental point of view. 
And, uh, and what's also interesting to notice is that these spin centers, they can also be used as uh, quantum sensors because all the energy levels are kind of sensitive to the electric and magnetic field. So, which means that by contrasting the photoluminescence before and bringing and before and after bringing this spin center close to a surface with a magnetic texture, for instance, uh, you can infer what's the local magnetic field just by contrasting the the uh, wave light uh, of the fluorescence here. And uh, so, and this is like something that my group has also been doing. So we we are able to show that you can characterize uh, electric dynamics through the relaxation of this spin qubit. So, but I'm not gonna be talking about this. Uh, so, uh, so essentially this is just like the introduction of like the spin centers uh, in, in solid state uh, systems. So as a great qubits, and uh, now I'm just gonna pause and ask if people have like any questions regarding, um, <clears throat> regarding this, the, the qubits we're gonna be using in this work. Uh, any questions? I, I have one. I was going to ask at the end, but if I can. Sure, yeah. Here? Yeah. Uh, it's just for general knowledge. Um, so in, in, this, in some of these pictures, you're showing this green laser focus on one qubit, but that's not really the case, right? So how, uh, how large is the focus and uh, how, is, uh, how does one solve this selectivity problem to excite only one or two uh, uh, qubits and so on. Right, so thank you for bringing up the problem behind the spin centers here, so because that's exactly that's exactly what I'm gonna be talking about during the next slide, right? So what Gerson is essentially saying is, uh, okay, and before addressing that, I'm just gonna go over like this, uh, the, let's say there is this kind of like real uh, to implement this quant this like spin centers as or qubits for a quantum computation we actually have to fulfill like five criteria criteria and actually those are the divisions of criteria so we have to be able to uh, initialize the qubit we have uh, we need to have like quantum gates that are faster than the coherence time so information cannot be lost before you start like playing around with those qubits you, have, you need like universal gate sets uh, and a qubit that can be read easily. And, and all of those four uh, are, are, are met by the spin centers. But the whole thing is like, uh, if you wanna do quantum computation, you need like many qubits. So you need a large number of qubits. And um, so this is called like scalability. And uh, so, which means essentially that one qubit, it's like nothing, it's not useful, you need like, many coupled or entangled qubits to really be able to uh, su suppress and overcome classical computation. And uh, so the, qu the natural question is whether we can couple and entangle different energy centers. And of course, like the answer is yes, because those are um, essentially like a tr spin triplet, right? So they're, they have a magnetic moment. So and therefore uh, you can, um, you, you have the dipole-dipole interaction between them but uh, if you guys remember the dipole-dipole interaction, it's like a super weak interaction, which only it's able to effectively couple and entangle these spin centers if they are uh, distanced by around like 20 nanometers, okay? And, and actually this, this creates a whole problem which it's connected to Jerusalem question because I, I have been like showing that if you shine the green laser, that's what you essentially have. But in reality, that's a lie. Uh, actually, if you shine green laser, this is essentially what you're gonna have because the spot rate, the, the size of the laser spot is around 200 nanometers, okay? So, which means that if you have two energy centers closed, separated by 20 nanometers, and you try to either read or initialize one of them, you're gonna be massing and affecting, and affecting, affecting the other end of the center nearby. So, so from here, it's kind of like clear to see the importance of have end the center separated by distances larger than the size of the laser spot, okay? And actually, this is the problem of having end the center as qubits, okay? Because you cannot uh, have them at what we call um, optically addressable 
uh, uh, special spatial separations. I hope that answers that answers your question. Okay, that's great. Uh, so so that's the problem we are like facing. They were great, but how we're going to be able to couple them at uh, optically uh, addressable distances? And this is essentially what I'm going to be like trying uh, to tackle in, in the in the remaining part of the talk. Uh, so to kind of like solve this issue, we in the field we say that. We, that the interaction between different the centers must be assisted by something, okay? So in other words, we need another system that can auxiliate the propagation of information from one energy center to the other one. So in, in our field, this is what people call a quantum bus, okay? And, uh, and this can be done, for instance, by having two energy centers coupled through a medium as for example, uh, uh, optical modes of an optical, optical uh, fiber, okay, where now you have like photons actually mediating the coupling between these and the centers. And this is just like a work where they, they were able to verify the, cup, cup, the entanglement between, or more specifically, the violation of the Bell inequality for like two NV centers separated by 1.3 kilometers. Okay, so you need a quantum bus. You need a medium to mediate uh, the interaction between these spin centers. And uh, so an optical fiber is there, like, great. But if you want, like, to make uh, quantum technologies, uh, if you want to make realization of quantum technologies in a kind of, like, chip scale, like a microchip scale, uh, then optical fibers are not good. So, so that's why we introduced or we are, like, proposing alternatives and our proposal, it's actually made, uh, it's based on coupling energy centers through a magnetic material, okay, where we have essentially magnets. So uh, essentially, and I'm going to be explaining what magnets are, but essentially we're going to be like doing the same as they did with, uh, with like phones, but now we're going to be using magnets. So, so in our case, the magnets are be like forming this quantum bus, this magnetic quantum bus, which is going to be like trans, trans, transferring the, the information from one qubit to the other qubit. So, uh, so this is like one of the one example, one scheme, one hybrid quantum system that we used. So we essentially have like our diamond, which is non-magnetic and contains uh, this, uh, the two spin centers here and over here. And on top of this diamond, we put, we place a magnetic material that's going to host the magnets. Okay, so this is essentially like the the setup of for our proposal. And and to be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, what we want, uh, we actually need three different ingredients. The first one we need coherent qubits. Okay, so coherent and center spins. And uh, <clears throat> this, the second one we also need coherent or long lived magnets at low temperature, okay? And the, the reason being, you if you transfer your information from your qubit to your magnum, and your magnum dies before reaching out the second qubit, then this kind of a magnet is not going to be use, useful for, for entangling and coupling, okay? So that's why you also need coherent magnets. And, and lastly, we also need a strong coupling between and the center spins and your magnum mode, okay? And we're gonna show why. So to, back to the first point, uh, as, I to, as I showed you guys, uh, this uh, spin centers, they have uh, really like uh, very good coherent properties, but, uh, but it's all these like second um, uh, coherence times that I showed you, those are like for envy centers super deep into the crystal, so very far from the surface. And actually what we what people like see is that the closer to the surface, so the closer to the surface, the small is the depth, which is just like indicated by here. So the, the closer to the surface, the smaller uh, or the shorter is your relaxation time, okay? And this happens because the closer to the surface you are, the more susceptible to like surface noise, okay? And this actually just like harm the coherence of like spin centers. And uh, and why we're talking about like having shallow spin centers here, why the depth is important? Well, because back to the point three, 
here, we want to have strong magnum and V coupling, which means that we want to place MV center super close to the magnetic material, and therefore they're going to be at shallow depths. Okay, so uh, so so you can see that this uh, the, the this depth dependence is like super important, but still people were able to show that for shallow spin centers and for diamonds that are isotopically pure, you can reach 1.5 milliseconds, which is still like very good. And uh, so, so like since this this depth dependence is it's super important and relevant for those hybrid systems, uh, this is like something we extensively studied also uh, in, in my group and also in, in Michael's group. And here I'm just like flashing some works that we developed together with experimentalists and we just like were able to model this depth dependence of different uh, different diamond terminations, but uh, and uh, so so this is just uh, I'm, I'm just like a parenthesis here. I'm yeah, sorry for like bringing all these words, but it's just to uh, this is another work with Peter Maurer from University of Chicago where we essentially show that by coating the surface of like diamonds, uh, this leads to an increase. Of the of the T1 relaxation time, as you can see here, non coded and coded. So just like a parenthesis. So I, the the takeaway message from these two slides is just to say that understanding the fluctuations and suppressing the fluctuations of 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 diamond surface is crucial for advancing this spin center based quantum technologies. And uh, and another one, I'm just gonna skip. Yeah, but anyway, uh, the, we are able like to uh, to. Uh, have like one uh, coherence times of 1.5 millisecond, which is like great for for what we want. Now back now, if we go to the second point, uh, the coherent magnet is a little bit like challenging. It's written here because actually uh, what you can see for YIG, for example, which is one of the most broadly used material by the magnetic community, it's that uh, if you are at room temperature, the line width or the lifetime. It's essentially like very long, okay. But as 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 soon as you start decreasing the temperature, this magnum lifetime starts to uh, decrease, or the line width starts to increase. And uh, and we want to work with low temperature magnums, and I'm going to explain why that. So it can be a little bit like challenging to work with YIG because of this uh, uh, rapid uh, decrease of the lifetime at low temperatures. So. For this reason, we, in collaboration with uh, people from Ohio, Yale, and Colorado State University, we we chose to work with uh, with this magnetic uh, material. It's an organic one called like Vita uh, and, uh, and and this material it's like fully characterized by by uh, my group, Michael's group, and also experimental group. So we fully characterize the magnetics and, and all of those materials, so we understand how. How the, mag the, mag the magnetic excitations work over there. You also have, since they're organic, you also have this um, very um, ways to like grow uh, your material with different shapes, which is also like very convenient if you want to design some um, some qubits in a weird like fashion. Um, and uh, and differently, like from YIG, for instance, we can see that here the line width does share like a similar increase as you lower the temperature, but for temperatures around like five Kelvin, you, for Kelvin, you kind of like regain the room temperature line width, okay? So this type of material avoids this kind of like problem that YIG does have. So, uh, and here just like another work we posted recently on archive where we also um, characterize like uh, transport phenomena rising from these magnetic bands and this i just want to say that we have like a it's a super new material but even though we have like a theoretical and experimental understanding of the physics therein um okay so now to the students um let's let's just like tackle the concept of like magnets so uh so you guys know that if we have like a magnetic moment and a magnetic field uh, just like if you use a commutation of, uh, of your magnetic field with your spin operator, uh, if you will, the, the spin is just going to process, process around the magnetic field. Uh, so this is called like Larmor precession. So, uh, so if you solve this 
this kind of like procession of spins around the magnetic field. The ground state, it's just going to be, uh, the spins are just aligned, but uh, the second highest energy state is the state where you have every, everything processing in phase. Okay, this is what people call the ferromagnetic main resonance. But um, but since there is kind of like interaction among different spins, okay, or more precisely like spin-spin interaction, which usually it's exchange interaction. Now the the solution for those uh, uh, for those like processions are uh, are so you you have like processions that are defaced. So if you look from the top, you're gonna see essentially like a wave. And this is what, this is like the so-called like uh, spin wave, or if you quantize the spin wave, this is what people like call magnets, okay? So this is just like a collective behavior of like coupled spins in a magnetic material, okay? And, uh, and this is actually what we're gonna be using. So we're gonna be using magnetic modes of like a disc, and here, this is just how the fringe field produced by these magnets, they look like. And here, just to say that we, again, uh, have a validation with experimental data. So we really know how to, how, how those magnets are created in those materials. And, uh, okay, so this kind of like um, closes the, the point number two. And now let's let's tackle the last point, which, which is like the magnum, the strong magnum uh, MV coupling. So, um, so this is essentially the Hamiltonian for the spin center, right? So here we see the, this is what we call the zero field splitting around 2.8 gigahertz. And then here we have like the same and just like lifting the degeneracy between the triplet plus one and the triplet minus one. And, uh, and if we add now the, 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 the same and splitting due to the magnums, okay? And remember, if you like solve divergence of B equals to zero, you're going to get that divergence of uh, H. It's going to be equal to minus divergence of M. And then you can use like Green's functions to solve, right? So you're essentially going to find that this is your magnetic field H, not the B1. So it's it's kind of like it's proportional to the integral of the magnetization, which means that if there is a dynamics of the magnetization of your spins, this is going to produce a magnetic field that's out, that also it's kind of like dynamical, okay? And by dynamical I mean, here, I mean just like oscillating and changing as a function of time. And uh, and this this uh, this magnetic field produced by the magnums, so the, the B for the magnums, um, can be decomposed in right and left or left circularly polarized oscillations. And, uh, and I'm just gonna skip this, but uh, actually what you can show it's that you can only, only the left circular polarization, it's gonna be able to couple to, let's say this zero and minus one transition, okay? So if we, which means that if you write now in the rotating wave approximation, whatever that means for the students, um, only the right, the left circularly polarization of the magnets, it's gonna couple the subspace zero to the subspace minus one, which is the subspace we're gonna be like defining our qubit, okay? Um, and, uh, and as you can see here, if I plot the solutions of the magnums as a function of magnetic field, we see that the frequency of the magnums, they do, they do cross with this like minus one energy level. So which means that we do have this, what we call like resonance condition between the energy center frequency transition and the magnum energy. So which means that you can annihilate, not annihilate, but you can have creation of the magnum by its spontaneous uh, decay of your qubit. We're going to tackle this later. Uh, this is just like a, a kind of animation showing that for, it takes a little kind of a while to, to start. Uh, yeah, so this is just like the, let's say the, the, the Ambler mode, M equals to six, for instance. And uh, and here we decompose into the right and left, are circular, circularly polarized, just to kind of like confirm that this magnum mode does have this left circular polarization, which is going to be important to to couple magnums to 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 the spin transition. Uh, in second quantization, that's how like the the Hamiltonian look like looks like in in, um, in the rotating wave approximation, and uh, so we have this the coupling strength, and here we have essentially the the lowering uh, of the or the raising of the spin and the creation 
of the of, of the magnum and here's just like the complex the hermitian conjugate but don't don't get scared about the equation i made like some slide to kind of like um, describe what this happens um with our system and subsystem so let's say that you have your nv center one initialized into the minus one okay you have like no magnums and you have your nv center initialized into the zero so um after letting the system interact uh, what happened is that you're going to have the lowering of the qubit and the creation of one magma excitation, okay? So this magma excitation is going to start to propagate and it's going to start now in, to interact with the second end of the center. And after like some time, which is proportional to 1 over G, this is going to excite the end of the center number 2 and just like annihilate the magma. So this is essentially what this Hamiltonian here is describing to us, okay? So I think like from this, this kind of like three slides, it's clear how this um, how this coupling uh, uh, mediated by magnum works, right? So you decrease, you lower your spin, you create a magnum, and the magnet's just gonna excite the other spin. So like in terms of like quantum gate operations, that's what's called people people call like the swap gate or a flip-flop gate, okay? So that's how you manipulate the states of two spins via this like manual chains, conceptually, of course. Um, so, but back to like this whole like uh, strong coupling regime. Um, so the coupling between those two uh, entities, they, to, they, they need to be like strong. And, um, and we can characterize this by what we call cooperativity. So the cooperativity is essentially the, the ratio of the coupling rate divided by the magnum decay rate times the ratio of the magnum uh, and the spin coupling divided by the decoherence rate, okay? So it, what this essentially quantifies, it's like how, how, how many times we can swap information between our NV center and our magnum before this information is kind of lost either in the magnum or in the and the NV spin state, okay? And then of course uh, the coupling regime, the strong coupling regime is it's 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 it happens when we have the cooperativity larger than one. So that's what we want. That's our goal here to have cooperative corresponding cooperativities with values larger than one. Excuse me. So. If we go back to this left circularly polarized mode with mx equals to six, and we calculate the corresponding cooperativity, that's essentially what we find for a plane minus 80 nanometers below the, the surface or the interface between the disk and the diamond. And, that, and as you can see, um, the we, we are able like to predict cooperativities around like 30, which is great for us, right? And, uh, and another point that is important is that this, this whole box here has essentially the dimension of the spot radius size. So which means that uh, you can like place one in the center here, another one here, and the laser, it's, it's gonna be able to address individually those spin centers. So, um, so which is great. We also show now, if you plot the cooperativity uh, on this like cross-sectional plane, we show that it's possible to have cooperativity larger than one for spin centers 90 nanometers below the surface, okay? So really avoiding this whole like surface noise, big deal that I, that I mentioned before. So, so this is like the first paper we published on this topic. And uh, so we were able to accomplish all of these three different ingredients and therefore uh, we, we we predict this the success of like this proposal with a kind of like high degree of confidence. Um, but we also tried like different materials, as for instance the most well-known gig. And this, and we tag we used this material and published like different work for this material and also different geometry. And um, as you can see here, I just represent the magnum, um, frequency dispersions, and then Vs. So you can see that there's there again. There's this resonance condition, which is like super important for having the coupling between magnum and V. Um, here is just like the magnum mode coupling uh, for different positions, uh, like some other graph that I'm just gonna skip. Uh, but what we also did in this work, besides calculating the cooperativity, which is like shown here, okay? 
So, uh, and I'm just going to comment, I'm just going to comment that the cooperativity for these materials, this material YIG, it's kind of like three orders of magnitude larger simply because the, the saturation magnetization of YIG, it's like around three orders of magnitude larger than the VTC and E1. On, and uh, and the, the dipole, dipole interaction between magnets and, and spins is really proportioned to, to a mass. So that's why you have like this huge, uh, enhancement of the cooperativity but um so so but what was like nice that we also did in this work was to really like simulate some uh some some uh, density matrix dynamics for two spin centers coupled via this like magnum mode and and for doing so we essentially like used this like Lindblad, Lindblad master equation formalism where uh we have um, not only a lifetime, a finite lifetime due to the magnons that it's given by this term here and this term over here, but also we have included the decoherence of them, the centers, by this rate, gamma 2. And uh, and we study essentially like two different protocols, and, uh, and and this is what we call like the own resonant protocol, and this is essentially what I described by that animation. So this is like just frequency of the MV1, frequency of the magnum, frequency of the MV2, and here is just like time. And, and here you start your system with NV1 and NV2 out of resonance with your magnum, which means they're not going to interact with your magnum strongly. And then you first bring the NV2 in resonance, so they're going to start to interact and you're going to excite this magnum. And uh, and later what you do, you, you just like switch off the NV2, so you bring NV2 out of resonance and you bring NV1 in resonance and just let the NV1 now to uh, interact with the magnum. So, and essentially that's, um, if you calculate like the fidelity and by fidelity, uh, it's, it's tough to explain in, in simple words, but uh, if you solve this this type of like system here, quantum mechanically, it's super easy. Uh, what you guys can see is that after this like final time here, this is the, the, the state that you're gonna be able to achieve if there are like no losses in your system, okay? So this is what we call like the ideal. But uh, actually when you include the losses, which are described by these three last terms here in the Lindblad master equation, um, actually you're not able to obtain this term here uh, fully, okay? So which begs you to introduce like a fidelity, which is just like represents how close to the final, to the ideal state you are and, uh, and that's like what we plot here and um, and by the by the gray line and you can see that fidelity achieves like 0.8 which is like good for for at like temperatures around 70 millikelvin and um and 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 here we have like the populations of nv1 and 2 and here we you can see what i showed before right this like flip flop of nv spins one and two so this is essentially what it's what's being like shown by this alternating oscillations between blue and orange. So you're really like just uh, <coughs> flip-flopping the states of your two qubits. Uh, so, so this is like super important because it shows like a, a direct measurement of like the entanglement in those systems produced by, by the magnets. So, um, but we tried also like other uh, protocols as for instance, this, the off resonance one where you essentially uh, have all the spins in off resonance, uh, all the energy centers in res off resonance with respect to magnum, and uh, and and this is like this is what we obtain, uh, which shows to to provide like better fidelity, and um, I can like explain this why in a sec, and uh, the the whole like reason between this is it's just that if you are off resonance, it means that your envy center can never excite magnets, okay? So you only couple two envy centers through what we call like virtual magnets because you're not exciting magnets for real because they have like a larger energy. So and if you're not exciting, so it's kind of like second order perturbation theory if you prefer. Um, so, and of course, if you're not exciting them directly, they're not gonna be decaying, right? So they're kind of like more robust in that sense and uh, and this just like shows the robustness as we increase the temperature. So for like super large temperature around three uh, millikelvin, 
where you have a huge population of magnets for their own for their own resonance, but for their off resonance you don't, and therefore you're still able to get like fidelities around eighty percent, and uh, but at super low temperature, then which is like uh, showed here, then both protocols are kind of like similar because at those temperature the magnet population is like per per energy level it's like much smaller than one, so they become kind of um, comparable even though the, the the gate speed of the own resonance is much faster as you can evidence by this uh, more rapid oscillations here compared to those one here so um so we we did like this, this extensive study comparing this protocol but uh but the real like takeaway message is that it's, it's really like possible to to couple and entangle this spin center through like the magnums the only problem is that this this requires like hundreds of millikelvin at least, which goes back to the initial problem about the about having like qubits as uh, sorry quantum dots as as, as qubits. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna mention that's gonna be like the last slide. And uh, uh, so the, now the question is, okay, so we're predicting something theoretically. So how do we can have dance? Uh, this kind of like magnum NV coupling or NV NV magnum mediated entanglement, right? So and and for like the students, so the first evidence that we we like to see is um, described by the following. So if you have your NV center coupled through your magnums by a cu coupling G, so effectively what happens is that uh, and I mean and to make the whole argument, you need to learn a little bit about the Green's function. But like, forget about all these equations. So what happens is first, when you have the NV center coupled to a magnum, you're first gonna observe a shift of the frequency, which is proportional to the real part of what we call like self energy. And besides that, you're also gonna have a broadening of your discrete energy levels, which is proportional to the imaginary part of the of the self energy. So, um, so effectively, okay, so if you think about, and now you have, um, this 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 complex self energy and you modify the 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 wave wave function of your nv center from let's say exponential of i omega n v t here we're taking h bar equals one uh and you introduce the self energy here which is just like it's just like renormalization of the total energy and then if you separate this sigma by the by the real part and imaginary you're going to see that the real part is just going to shift the effective frequency of the nv but the imaginary part, it's going to give like a decay, right? Not an oscillatory part anymore, but a decay because now you have I multiplying by I. So this is going to decay, which means that the, you're going to see actually a magnum induced lifetime of uh, your NV center. And, uh, and actually we were able, we were able like to verify this experimentally with this Eagle example and uh, together with uh, David's Oshelum group in Chicago, where um, we, we essentially measure the T1 relaxation as a function of the magnetic field. And, uh, and we are able to like predict, um, uh, not able to predict, but we are like able to explain fully the experimental data with this theory where you have magnus coupled to, uh, to, to our NV center. So this is kind of like the first evidence that like really magnums, they do couple to NV centers. And this is like the, the magnum signature on the uh, induced uh, decay um, of the NV center spin. Um, so that essentially like that's the takeaway of um, the takeaway message here. We are proposing hybrid quantum systems a magnetic quantum system to, to couple and entangle qubits, a uh, spin center qubits. And, uh, and I said that that was the last slide, but I just have one more. So what we're like trying to do now is since I worked a lot with topological insulators. Um, so the idea now is uh, instead of using like trivial magnets, we're going to be using topological magnets because uh, those have like super localized wave functions. So we expect to enhance the the coupling between the spin center and uh, and the magma mode if we place the spin centers at the end of this uh, magnetic crystal. And we also expect that the lifetime of topological magnets to be l uh, longer 
than the trivial magnets, and therefore we expect to to really like enhance um, the the potential uh, of this uh, hybrid magnetic system. Um, yeah, just like some other works, but I'm just gonna jump. So I really would like to thank you everyone for listening, and I'm gonna also take the opportunity to uh, advertise that I'm recruiting uh, PhD students and postdocs for fall 2024. So if you uh, if you felt excited about any of the research topics I mentioned during this talk, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me via this email. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you everyone for listening and sorry for taking longer than I expected to finish this presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, Okay, so now we have time for, for questions. Um, we're going to wait to see if anybody raises their hand or opens their mic. You can also write the questions and I'll reach Dennis. One. Okay, while people are thinking, I, I have a couple of questions, Dennis. If you don't Please. Mind. No. Um, okay. So the first thing is just to be sure that I understood everything. So I was asking before about the spot size of the laser. That doesn't change. So it's 200 nanometers. So the, the idea of using the magnums uh, uh, is to replace the dipole-dipole interaction. So it, it, uh, it, it is everywhere. It couples every possible quantum dot in the system. But then the, 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 the laser... Um, so. Actually, I didn't understand how to solve the problem of the size of the laser spots using magnets. Right. Okay. So that's a good question. And maybe I did not emphasize that as much as I should. But uh, if we if we go back to, let me find here this slide. So if we take a look at this implementation, for instance, uh, so that's the... Uh, Basically, so your, your, your centers will be uh, at a distance around 200 nanometers should be compatible with the spot size, is that it? But I can increase the distance and the magnums allow you to increase the distance between quantum bits, is that it? Uh, so, so, yeah, okay, so now my, unbelievable, okay. So, so the laser spot radius, it's around like 200 nanometers and um, so if you now, but if you now place this this disc, okay, on top, I'm just I'm reaching the slide here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here. So this is slide here. So uh, so this is essentially the size of the spot radius. So what we what we are like claiming is that now if you place one in the center here, okay. And another one here. Now you can couple them to this magnonic mode, which is kind of like evidenced by the orange line. And you you have spatial resolution to read and initialize both of them independently. Okay, yeah. So that that's what I was thinking. So it, you're going to the dipole dipole interaction is too short for that. So you're going to have replaced with the magnons. So the the long range distance. Exactly. So now, now your any centers must be far apart, so you can have there is the exactly. pollution. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So the magnum uh, mode is extended, and therefore you have this more long range interaction between. So the, the, the size of your quantum processor is going to be limited by the the spot size of the laser, and uh, a two hundred nanometer. Is that a, a rigid limit, or is that any, any hope to, to get a smaller spot size? No, that's a super optimistic limit, I would say. Yeah, so I think that's the maximum that they can uh, reduce, because there's also like the problem of reducing too much and increasing the power. Okay, so you can use like lengths to kind of focalize more, but this increases the power, and then you have like temperature problems and etc. So this is like the, the limit, and... Uh, yeah, so the the spot size is uh, of the rate of the laser it's one limit, and the other one is like how big your magnetic material can be. Because I, I didn't show here, but the larger the magnetic material, 
the smaller the coupling is because the magnum becomes more delocalized. So, so there's also like a limit in this regard. Yeah, so you cannot make like one magnetic material of one meter and uh, and still be able to strongly couple one of the centers to spins. Okay, and, and here you, you were drawing the the centers at positions that are uh, are radially opposed. Like, is that is that a constant? Any any reason for that, or could I try to design a, a magnum excitation that? Uh, uh, a different geometry that allows me to put more than these centers nearby uh, right uh so um, in principle that was like just that was let's say the the easiest configuration we thought about really having envy centers at the far end of like a bar just to claim how much distance they can be and still be entangled and coupled but in principle you keep you can you can be fancy, clever, and create any kind of like geometry, and uh, and different geometries benefit different uh, in, in different gating protocols and etc. So for sure, you can like play around with different two uh, D arrays of qubits, and uh, yeah, so it's whatever like suits the the the, the interest. Yeah, I have two more questions. Um... You got me confused about the ideal temperature for this because in the beginning you said that you want a small radius to get your room temperature. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, but then at the end you were showing these coherence plots, and then you show uh, at 300 Kelvin you have a uh, small coherence, but then you have you, you decrease the temperature and uh, picks up and right. then goes back to the small coherence. That's fine. What I didn't understood here is that if coherence is already small at 300 Kelvin, why do we want to go below? Room temperature seems ideal. So, okay, so that's a very important point. So probably the most, the most important point of this talk. So the, coherent, the coherence of these spin centers, they, it's around like millisecond, sorry, second or millisecond, okay? So, so which means that they can operate at room temperature. But, uh, but what happens is in order to solve the problem of uh, optical and their other independent addressability of spin centers, we need to introduce the magnums as the mediator. And what happens is if you take a look at this lean blad equation, so here, this is like the, num the number of like excited magnums. So which means that if you're at room temperature, the magnum decay rate, which is going to be kappa, which is just like a constant, times the number of magnums, it's it's going to increase exponentially if you're at like at large temperature. So so which means that the, the coherence of the magnums it gets suppressed super quickly as you increase further, you increase the temperature further. So uh, so that's actually what it's limiting. It's really um, the the, cohere, the magnums are being sh are, be are becoming short lived as we increase the temperature, and that's why we see this like reduction on the on the fidelity as as temperature increases. So okay, so which is like uh, so it, it, this is like very important question, Gerson, because what would be like optimal is to find magnums with a larger energy, because then you keep the H bar omega divided by KBT at the same ratio at larger temperature. So if you're able to have, here we're talking about gigahertz, but if you're able to have like resonant spin centers with magnums at the terahertz, then this could be done at room temperature easily. But nowadays this is, uh, it's a little bit challenging because there are kind of like few spin centers with very good coherent properties and spin splitting around like terahertz, yeah. And yeah, so what a very good question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, it's clear. Uh, just one last question about the materials, uh, ideal materials for this. Um, so you, you're, you based it most of the motivation on these diamond centers, which are 3D, and then have EEG, which is 3D as well, right? Um, yeah. But then at, I think at the outline, at the end of the talk, you said uh, something about uh, 2D materials. So what about to uh, defects in 2D materials. Why not? It's a problem because of the coherence time. Um, what is the status right. of it? Right, very, very great question as well. So, uh, so 
2 D materials are like very, well, very resourceful to say the least. So there are 2D materials that are magnetic. There is also, so you can make like 2D magnets. And also there's like 2D materials like boron nitride, which contains also spin center defects. So you essentially have the same idea, the same concept of the nitrogen vacancy, but now within this like 2D uh, uh, material. So you can implement uh, and use the idea that I, that I proposed here for 2D materials. And, uh, and we have been thinking about that uh, already and even developed some calculations. The problem is that since it's, you're talking about a strict 2D material, uh, the noise, the surface noise that I mentioned before, here it's kind of like the only source of the noise. So for those materials who have a lot of dangling bones, and since the qubits are not embedded within the bulk of the material, they're not like super protected and they're like super uh, influenced and susceptible to whatever it's going on in outside outside of the medium. Yeah, that's so, what I thought. But then then you, you are thinking about the isolated material. But once you put the, the LIGO, once you put the the, the, the magnetic mag mag encapsulate on top, encapsulate, then you can have, you can try to solve this problem. Maybe, maybe the 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 cap layer is large enough to avoid the outside road and so on. For sure, for sure. I think, uh, yeah, so I agree completely, yeah. So, and the same problem also happens for magnums. Magnums are super short-lived for those 2D magnets, simply because surface is everything that there is. So, and therefore they get scattered too easily by any imperfection over there. So, but of course, that's just like a technical uh, experimental limitation, right? Uh, I, I, I still think that uh, those systems, they have the potential to, 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 to implement this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, hybrid schemes that, that I mentioned. And especially because the, what would be like uh, super um, enhanced for this uh, hybrid systems made out of two to the materials to stack on top, on top of each other, it's that the distance between the spin center and the magnum is like super short, right? So we, so even though you lose on the coherence aspect, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, strengthening the coupling just because they're like super close to each other, which it's not what we have in this proposal. So for sure, long story to make a long uh, story short, I think that. Uh, trying to implement this type of uh, systems with 2D materials is super valid. And uh, and the only problem, it's really an experimental problem of, uh, it's like a material science problem, I would say. The, the more they uh, they improve the coherent properties but, uh, of- is that, is that any any DFT calculation, any, any simulations uh, showing an ideal 2D material that cannot be realized experimentally yet? But uh, are there proposals of uh, optimal 2D materials? Uh, yeah, so there are like, nowadays there are like really few very stable magnetic materials at room temperature because uh, in 2D you also have this, uh, well, I'm not, uh, not, I'm just gonna skip that part. But uh, nowadays there are like few magnetic materials that fit fewer 2D magnetic materials that host like magnums, one being the chromium ionide CRI3. So this is probably the most uh, well known from a ab initio point of view and also from an experimental point of view. So people have been able to characterize those in a nice manner and measure everything. So that would be like the most, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so, yeah. But, uh, but I mean, this is like still a field in development, right? So they have been exploring the electronic properties of 2D materials extensively. And now they're kind of like switching gears and starting to to uh, to study like magnetism to the materials. So uh, I think it's just about time for us to, to know the answer for your question. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Anyone? Uh, Vernak wrote to me to ask you, I'm sorry he had to leave, uh, 
um, a little bit before the end of your talk, but um, he, he, he was thanking you for the very nice talk as well. Great, thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the talk now. So thanks, Dennis. Um, thanks for the very nice talk, and I hope to see you see you soon. Thank you very much for the invitation once again. Yeah. Thanks.